It's great to be here, and my, uh, I, I'm kind of shocked to be here, to be honest, because I feel like it's going back two years, but I've only got eight minutes, so I'm going to cram it in, right? And you've got to really turn up your ears for this eight minutes. One of the things that I want to start with is that um, my wife and I are expecting a baby, and it's our first baby, and it's going to be in January. Yeah, exactly. Woohoo. <laughs> and... I, I had a, we, we're not going to find out the sex, so we're not, we're not sure yet. And we, I had a dream a few weeks ago, and I dreamt it was a girl. And in the dream, the midwife or God, I'm not sure which, but said to me, it's a girl. And the, my first response was, and I said this to Kira when I woke up, uh, but if it's a girl, how am I going to protect it? And I thought about that for days. I said, why, why that sense, why that need to want to protect a girl as opposed to a boy. And I kind of came to the conclusion in my own head and in my own heart that it was out of love. And an old friend of mine said, you know, you're never going to feel real love until you have a child and you hold that child in your hands. Now, I cannot wait for that. I can't wait for it. But I'm also as nervous as hell. And I think that same love that we all feel for whether it's our children or for whomever else is the reason we're all here tonight. It's the love for people, it's a love for projects, it's a love for movement, it's a love for change, but it's what connects us. And it's that sense that there's a truth in the world and that we're on this journey to find it that has us all here for whatever reason we came, but it's because of love. Growing up, I always thought there was a truth in life and my dream was always to play hurling with Claire. When I joined the Claire team, there was a physio, a really, really nice girl, and she was like one of these old sages. And I remember we used to have these long conversations. Anyone that's been an athlete will know that the physio bench is the one place you can be vulnerable as an athlete, and it's probably the one place you talk. And I remember very often chatting to this woman, and I remember one day she looked me straight in the eye and she said, you know what, Tony? You think there's a truth in life, and someday you're going to find out that you're wrong, that there isn't. And I was crushed because a bit of a dreamer of a teenager, I felt that there was a truth to life. And life has shown me that it was she that was wrong. Fast forward 10 years ago, two years ago, almost to this night, and we were in the first round of interviews for the SEI Awards. And I, I, my biggest memory of it was that we all filed in, there was 40 of us, and I was sitting right at the front in the DCU canopy to the left. And Sean Coughlin got up and he started talking about the reason we were in the room was because we were here to change the world. Now, I'd never in my life heard anyone be that assertive about something that I thought all my life made me feel weird. The fact that I felt we could go out and change the world. And here was this man talking about that it was acceptable. I'm not ashamed to know, but I was on the day. I actually bowed my head and I cried because I thought to myself, at last, it was as if there was this home that I thought existed, and there in that room, I knew it was real. I knew it was a real thing to dedicate your life to trying to change the world. It wasn't a dream, it could be a reality. And that's for me what SEI represents. In the two years since Soar and Carl and I won that award, I know for a fact, we wouldn't have got to a fraction of the young people that we have got to if it wasn't for SEI. Beautiful young boys and girls, teenagers with dreams of their own. And, they, and we do for them what SEI has done for us. They give us permission to dream. And what a thing to give to our young people. You know, in those 10 years that SEI has been in existence, many of us have lost our faith in the structures that held our country together. Many of us have lost that faith. And, and I believe that as a result, our country has, has been traumatized. And I think there's a healing that's needed to occur. And here's the best thing about it. I think we're all part of that healing. We all play our role in it. We all get to take our place in it. And ultimately, we get to hand on to our children something they can, they can be so proud of. One of the things that, when I was putting these few words together, because I spent the last four days in bed with the flu, by the way, just in case you think, think that uh, this is easy right now. It's not. 
But I was thinking about tonight and I was getting excited as it, as it came closer because when I look at this group, I see the next stage of the story. And I'd just like to finish by addressing you guys. And then I'd like to address two other groups of people. By the way, how's this going? Good. Because it was going all one way for a while there. <laughs> I just want to, first of all, I want to address you guys, but I'm actually going to speak to everyone when I do, but it's for you, right? The journey these guys are going to go on isn't the easiest of ones. It's absolutely the road less traveled. My sense of it is, in the past, religious organizations do what nowadays social entrepreneurs do. But in that world, it was acceptable to go on retreat. It was socially acceptable to renew yourself, to reflect on life, and to go out and give it back again. So. I said to you two weeks ago, and Tommy mentioned the word tenacity, and I said to you on that day that I met you, be tenacious with your dreams, but also take care of yourself. I'm only learning that that's as important a factor on this journey as anything else. The other thing I want to say to you is, this feels very strange, by the way, speaking to eight people, and there's a whole other room over there. But the other thing that I would say, and this because I know there's people in the audience that, that love these people, that have been with them on this journey. What I'd say is, there's a community for you. There's a community that would be there for you when your own family, your own friends, even your lover doesn't understand. And how would they? Sometimes you don't understand why you do what you do. But there is a community there for you, and tap into that. The next group of people I'd love to just address is, that, is those that make it possible for us to chase our dreams. The funders and the people that resource what we do. You know, this morning I was thinking about what's, what's the metaphor? And I don't know if you've seen the film, The Schindler's List. I'm not even going to ask for a group, uh, show of hands. But if you haven't, try and see it. It's an amazing film. But there's a guy in it, and he, he essentially, he helps Jews escape from concentration camps. And for me, and I don't think this is dramatic, the people that allow us do what we do, they're somewhat like him. They allow organizations like ours bring people to a better place. And alone, we could never do that. So to the funders and the, the people that resource the visions, the people that trust the fact that our, our madness has, has reason in it, I'd say continue to give. And in turn, it will give to you. You know that, those that you have given already. And lastly, to SEI. From Carl and I, the journey we have on, been on with SOAR has been absolutely incredible. We've met so many amazing young people that all they wanted was for someone to see them. That's all. And when they were seen, they knew that they were enough and they were valid. But to SEI, as you enter the next 10 years, don't let what got you to here be lost. That maverick spirit, that willingness to push the boundaries. Don't do what has happened elsewhere in the social enterprise world around the world where it becomes institutionalized. Be wild and be maverick and keep pushing those boundaries. Don't settle for what has been achieved. Push onwards. Because our children, please God, our child in January, their lives actually depend on what we decide to do our days. And finally, the work we do is very much built on meaning. You derive great meaning from it. But I once was someone who didn't know where to find meaning. And to the people in the audience who come here and you're almost looking from the outside in, you're not a social entrepreneur. I want to finish with a story. I remember it was years ago, I was 19, I was walking down the street with a friend of mine, it was a girl, and we came across a woman and she was maybe 55, 60, and she was, a, she was living on the streets. And we got chatting, and the older woman said to my friend, you've got beautiful hair. And my friend said, uh, so have you. And the old woman said, not now, but I used to. And that's what I miss most. My friend dug into her bag and she pulled out a comb. And we sat on the side of the street in Ennis. It's not a big town, so we were probably a bit of a sight. And she started combing the old woman's hair. And I will never forget the look on that old woman's face. Again, it was like some of the children that we see. She just was seen. What's the reason for that story? This is it. For those of you who may not take up the mantle of being a social entrepreneur, you don't have to leave your job to change the world. There's many, many ways you can do it. 
You can do it in your everyday life. You just have to be ready for it and willing to act and do something. And all you need to be to do, like all of us, is just do it with love. So thanks very much and, and congratulations.